So thank you very much, Sean. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to come and talk to you guys uh, today. So Amazon are a key alliance partner for us globally. We do a lot of work together. Uh, some really interesting work in healthcare as part of that. Um, one of the things we're doing is we've actually built an end-to-end -end, um, solution for the patient journey as well, built on AWS and then the Salesforce platform. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today. Today I thought I would talk about some of the more tactical um, opportunities and solutions that, that we've been building, some, some sitting on top of AWS, um, and some of the design principles that we've uh, found important. I'm non-technical by background. I don't make any apology for that. I think it's really interesting that um, we're seeing a bit of a shift from solutions being developed for people to use to actually people who are involved in the problems of healthcare getting involved in the design and delivery of these solutions. And I think that's a positive change. Have to do it in tandem and with the technical people. Um, but uh, it's, it's really, really important that that shift's happening, I think. Um, so I want to cover three things today. Now, I told you I was a non-technical person. <laughs> Green button, the green button. No, that's just the gr that green button. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to set a bit of context around the future of health. I think it's important to think about about that. Um, then talk, as I said, about some of the smart health solutions that, that we've developed and seen elsewhere, and some design principles. There was a lot of um, synergy with what Angus was just talking about, so you'll see some, some overlap there. Um, I did, apologies, you're speaking, hearing from another Brit, but I am coming from an Australian context. I've been here for nearly four years. Um, but I do think it's interesting to think about the two systems. So the UK system... Um, I think one of the advantages they have, which Angus alluded to there, is actually some of the systems in place for sharing data, not from a technical standpoint, but actually a, a slightly more integrated system than we face here in Australia. That gives them an, an advantage. That said, Australia has a big advantage at the moment, which is I think we have more digital data available to do stuff with um, if we take the opportunity to do that. So we can rapidly deploy really useful and innovative solutions into the Australian market because the data is there and it's available. So we have a slightly easier task ahead of us, but we need to get moving. Um, otherwise, the UK are going to overtake us, I think. So that's my call to action for us. So a little bit of context around the future of health. And I think the first thing to say is we're living in exponential times. Um, so if you think about the types of technologies that are coming to healthcare and being used in healthcare, nanotechnology, AI, uh, the genome sequencing, you know, that, that, the pace of change with those things is just happening at such an accelerated rate. So the human genome used to take 13 years to sequence and cost a billion dollars. Now we're talking a matter of hours, soon it'll be minutes, no doubt, and less than $100. That's, that's incredible pace of change. What that means looking into the future, I think, is it's, there's a level of uncertainty there. Um, that we can't really predict exactly what's going to happen. So we can perhaps see five years ahead, possibly seven, but beyond that, it actually becomes very difficult to conceptualize what the future's going to be like. So that's my caveat for saying when I start talking about what the future's going to be like, we actually, we don't know yet what we don't know, and that makes it really interesting uh, and an exciting place to work. But we are seeing some trends, and these are trends that we're seeing globally. The first of which is around affordable care for all. Um, so every single health system on the planet, whether it is privately funded, fully publicly funded like the NHS, or the mixed system that we have in Australia, is unsustainable financially. The cost and the proportion of GDP is rising at, at a rate that's not, not manageable. So we have to find solutions to that. And some of the other trends that we're seeing are, are the beginnings of solutions in that regard. Um, so this shift, which again Angus mentioned in his presentation, to proactive, predictive, preventive care, moving away from health care to, to well-being and, and staying healthy, is a critical part to, to get right. I think there's some really interesting things happening around community. If you look at healthcare over the last 20, 30 years, it started in the community. We kind of moved away from that model, and you're seeing coalescence around communities again, and those might be physical communities with care moving out into community settings, and there's some emerging evidence about good models in that regard. Uh, or it might, be, it might be digital communities, so particularly patients with rare and complex diseases are actually now able to find their communities online and support one another and share. So the concept of community is, is coming back, and I think it's coming back in a really positive and important way. 
shift in the trusted caregiver-patient relationship. We have been talking about patient experience, patient empowerment, again, for as long as I've been working in healthcare, um, but that is increasingly becoming a tenant, and I do think we are now starting to see that shift towards an empowered consumer, and digital is enabling that. Right, so the fact that you can, my brother uh, lives in Sweden, when he wants to get an appointment, he just goes online and just gets a, a video consultation. That's the most convenient to him. So it's no longer a one-to-one -one relationship with his specific doctor. He has a one-to-many. He prioritized convenience over that one-to-one -one relationship. That won't always be the case. That's his choice, his preference. But it certainly requires a shift in that relationship. And then this N equals one of personalized care, which again Angus uh, alluded to, and that's not just about um, specialized drugs and targeted therapies, that's personalized ex exercise programs, that's personalized experience. The efficacy evidence is absolutely there for this. Cost effectiveness is on the fence, and part of the problem is around data. And actually at the moment, the lack of availability of data to make that personalized care easy and seamless is part of the cost. It's not the only, part, only cost effectiveness issue, but it's certainly part of it. Um, and that's why, or part of the reason I think, you see this massive change in terms of what's happening in data and information and technology in healthcare. The fact that I'm here talking at an AWS summit in healthcare, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. If you look at the big technology players, seven out of those 10 are in healthcare, are doing things in healthcare. So those technology players coming into healthcare is accelerating the pace of change. And, and I think that's a, that's a good thing, as long as the healthcare system is able to, to keep up. That's a challenge on us. Um, and then the, the shift, to, I won't cover all the things that Angus talked about as well in terms of data ownership and privacy, and et cetera. Um, but I will just mention regulation very briefly in that we, the regulators cannot keep up with what's happening, um, not only in healthcare, in every sector. So you are seeing a forced shift in regulatory behavior, which again, I actually think is a good thing, to longer term accountability and, an, and more of an outcomes focus. And I think that's a trend we'll continue to see. So those are the trends. And this is our vision for what the future of health will look like. Empowered consumer at the center, absolutely underpinned by radically interoperable data and platforms. Um, and that's not just healthcare data. So the different and new types of data that can be used to inform healthcare, I think, are fascinating. Voice is one of those. Voice can be a predictor for your mental health. There's actually been a study done that says it's, it's a predictor of cardiac uh, event. That's just amazing. We don't use that data at all to date. But also your shopping practices. Shopping um, practices can, can be a key indicator of your mental health. So that type of data coming together will give, a, give us new and, and interesting insights and hopefully shift us from this reactive care through to something that's genuinely more proactive and preventative. I'm going to play a very short video just to give a bit of a flavor of what that might look like. Ruben. Before their day even starts, they are providing a detailed snapshot of their health and wellness to their network. Maria slept great, but Ruben, who has a history of depression and anxiety, tossed and turned all night. Data from his neuroendocrine system shows a spike in cortisol. That may be a sign that he could be headed for a significant depressive episode. So before he's even awake, his network has placed time in his busy schedule to talk with a virtual therapist about ways to reduce his stress. 20 years from now, radically interoperable data and open secure platforms can allow consumers to own their own journey of health, providing them with a holistic, real-time view of themselves and their environment, a system in which personalised experiences that are highly tailored to one's preferences and needs are the norm not the exception, and where care and services can be accessed quickly and seamlessly. Consumers are increasingly willing to share their personal data through wearable technology, smart appliances in the home, and even with the home itself. This vast pool of data forms the basis of their personal health profiles so that changes or deviations can be detected and addressed immediately. This information empowers consumers to take control of their well-being in ways that were impossible in the past. Whether it's proactively heading off depressive episodes for Reuben, or getting Maria her time-released antihistamine well ahead of a high pollen day, 
This data also provides more opportunities than ever before to glean novel insights into the health of entire communities and to enable research and scientific breakthroughs at a rate that will only increase exponentially as technology continues to evolve and to integrate into our daily lives. Tailoring care individually based on ever advancing capabilities to capture, interpret and act on near perfect data in real time is a radical change. This change will demand a complete rebuild of today's healthcare system and the collaboration of several actors, some old and many new. Those with deep roots in care delivery must ask themselves how they can use data and technology to transform what well-being and care delivery means. Players in the health ecosystem will include non-traditional ones, such as those focused on the data platforms and tools that enable this new model of health. And regulators, finances and intermediaries will play a new role in this new vision. Disruptive thinking and a commitment to emerging technology are more important than ever before. Because the future isn't as far off as it seems. In fact, it's at your very fingertips. So that might seem far-fetched to some of you, but actually the technology that underpins that is there, there already. It's just a case of getting through some of the challenges with security, privacy, and the other things that have been discussed. Um, but we could put that system in place fairly quickly today. Um, it does mean, I think, a shift for the industry, though. Um, and these are, these are our perspective on the new types of organization, types of function that will be needed in the system. Some of it's traditional, health products developer, care providers, I think specialty care operators. I don't see any move away from specialty tertiary hospitals happening anytime soon, nor should there be. But if you look at this set of uh, businesses on data and platform on the left-hand side, they become increasingly key features of the future healthcare system. You have to believe a number of things are true to enable that health system to occur though. And I think the most difficult for me is actually patients um, taking charge and, and of their own healthcare and being motivated to change. And that's probably because of my inherent um, stubbornness and lack of willingness to change. So I know I should eat more green leafy vegetables. I know that I should go to the gym more. I know I should drink less wine, but I still don't do it. So how do we make sure that those shifts happen and those behavioral shifts, and I'll, I'll come on to give some examples of, of how that might be happening uh, using technology in a moment. So I wanted to talk, and Angus gave some fantastic examples of some of the innovations that are happening. I'll share a few that we've built that are much more targeted. So I've called this, we call them smart health solutions. I run a team of 20 people in Deloitte, which is largely, you'll be relieved to know, made up of technical people and data scientists, um, but also has clinicians and, and um, healthcare ex industry experts like myself involved. Um, and we've been building specific solutions to target specific healthcare problems. Um, there have been some interesting lessons learned along the way. So our first proof of concept, uh, taking industry experience from elsewhere, we decided we'd build an eight-week proof of concept around predictive um, algorithms in a hospital setting. A year and four weeks later, we finally got this thing up and running. And part of the challenges were unique challenges in healthcare around privacy, security, integrating data that we needed to work through. I'm happy to say now that those proof of concepts do just take eight to 12 weeks, but it took us a long time to get that first one sorted. Um, so I'll cover off a few of these. I just need to manage time a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna talk about mobile because as per the uh, design principle that was talked about earlier, it's, it's all, mobile first is here. We mustn't be designing anything that isn't mobile enabled. Um, that, that's happened. I think we have to take that as a given, but I'll cover off some of the rest. I'm gonna start with one which isn't ours because we haven't yet in Australia built something in virtual reality in healthcare, but I would love to. This is from a cl clinical trial that's currently underway at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Um, and, and this relates to the behavioral um, management issue that I spoke about before. So they are trialing, I've had some very good uh, early results, a, a virtual reality stroke education program, which is personalized. So they take the CT and the MRI of that specific patient and build a virtual reality education set, uh, session for them about how their stroke happened. They take them on a journey through their blood vessels to see what actually happened to them when they had their stroke. 
Um, and that, that trial is ongoing, but the early indications are that it has a massive impact on people's motivations around lifestyle and rehabilitation. Uh, so I think really interesting stuff happening there. The approach we took in Deloitte is to say, let's actually start from the problems, so the user needs, um, as per the NHS guiding principle, and say, actually, what is it we're trying to solve for? What are the goals that we want to deliver? Is it about waiting time reduction? Is it about providing ner freeing nurses up for more time to care, length of stay, improving experience? What are the things that we might be able to impact on? And built some solutions off the back of that. Some of you may have heard of Deloitte Assist before. Uh, this is built, it sits on top of, it uses an Alexa device and sits on top of AWS. And this is a, effectively a voice-enabled workflow management tool, which is being used to provide deeper insights or, um, from patients on the ward to help nurses manage their time effectively. So it's, it's, it replaces the nurse call button in the sense that you have an Alexa device next to each bed, um, and instead of just pressing the, the nurse call button when you need assistance, you can actually say, Alexa, I'm thirsty, or Alexa, I need a pillow, um, or be specific about what your needs are. And then the technology triages that request um, as an able to identify which ones are urgent or not. So Alexa, I'm in pain, will give you a higher, higher priority than someone who needs a glass of water, and can also point it to the right person. So you may need a nurse to come to your bedside, or you may just actually need um, a porter to come and provide something for you. So it enables that kind of functionality. And it was, it was built because um, a Deloitte partner had, um, his father was in hospital, very proud gentleman, um, and he needed to go to the bathroom, press the nurse call bell. He had no feedback to know when the nurse was coming, whether they were coming. Uh, decided he was going to get out of bed and make his way to the bathroom himself. Fell, broke, fractured his femur, um, and unfortunately he never left the hospital. That was, um, he died uh, several weeks later. And that was the motivation to say we must do something better. So that's how Deloitte Assist came about. Um, I'll talk briefly about theatre optimization. Now, when I ran a surgical services department 15 years ago, we were talking about theatre optimization. It's so in a UK hospital, every theatre minute cost us £16. So we looked at our, we had data available then, we looked at our average procedures by patient, by type, and tried to really optimise to say, let's not waste a single moment of that precious theatre time. And that was fantastic. But now we're using natural language processing to be much more targeted and specific around cohorts of patients. So what happens if it's a patient with a hernia with COPD? How long do they take for their operation generally by surgeon? It always varies by surgeon. And using that type of natural language processing to ameliorate and improve tools that exist already has, has then shown the next shift in productivity in theater optimization. So that's just an example of one of the hospitals we did this in, which managed to get you up to that kind of 80, 85% utilization, which makes a big difference. Um, in hospitals. Talk a little bit about simulation and digital twins. Um, I might be able to play this, no. There's a video that you can't see it. Um, so this is increasingly becoming um, uh, useful tools in healthcare. So here's one we built for emergency care optimization. Um, there is a little video that runs, but I can't, can't get it to work. But essentially, it's a digital twin of the emergency department. And you plug in all of the variables around what's happening in that emergency department based on the data. And then you can play with it and see what happens if I put another nurse in triage. What will that do to my queuing? How will that impact on, on the department and the department's eff efficiency and, and the, the productivity of the workforce and, and how they can best manage their workload? So you can use it either for a forward planning tool, you build a simulation and then you play with it, or you can use it live to understand what's happening in the emergency department and therefore what, how you need to respond and how you need to, to manage those inputs. And then um, the last one that I'm going to talk to you is, this was our one year and four week proof of concept that we built, which is now up and running in the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney, which was around predictive um, cardiac al an algorithm. So, so what we did is said, can we identify those patients who are likely to have a cardiac event using, using AI? Um, and, and finally we're able to, to do that. So essentially when a patient comes, whether they come to the emergency department, whether they end up in geriatrics, orthopedics, or cardiology, 
we can identify those patients that are at risk and send an alert to the community re uh, cardiac rehab management team who can then actually take action to prevent uh, deterioration in that patient. This is the kind of stuff that I get really excited about because it can make a real difference to the, a difference to the end outcomes of patients. So those are just some of the healthcare solutions that we're building. I'm going to talk very, very briefly around the design principles that we've learned, some of which overlap very nicely with uh, the ones that Angus discussed earlier. And essentially, we have five. And first and foremost, and this is where uh, providers like AWS come in, is about being a connector. It is absolutely critical that the solutions that we develop can integrate and interoperate with other systems. So 325,000 mobile health apps out there, less than 2% of those actually connect to anything else. And yes, while it might be useful to gather new data in an isolated way, for me, if you want to get new insights or accelerate insights, you need to combine that new data with what we already know. So that connection and being a connector is absolutely critical. Um, we've used the same language here, Angus is obviously Eng an English thing, but being a, the right peg for the right hole. So do not build a million dollar solution for a $10 problem, and do not build a solution for a problem that isn't really there in the first place. So aligning what we design to the needs is absolutely critical. I've got an extra one in there, which is around keeping it real. And this, this um, for me, is really about when you're building these solutions, we have to recognize that there is a trust deficit in place around healthcare solutions, not helped by scandals like Cambridge Analytica, um, inadvertent loss of data and, and various breaches. Um, so when we're designing, we have to be honest about two things. So the, the first thing I think is actually around um, our own per perception and position that we take around the data that we're using and always recognizing that the data that we're using to develop these solutions does not belong to us. It belongs to the consumer who's created that data. And if we take that and take an ethical standpoint from the beginning, that's the first key element. And the second part of it, I think, is being really honest about our own technical capabilities and not going beyond those. So not trying to build something that we actually don't have the technical capability to do. That's when we need to partner, bring in third parties to make sure that actually what we're building is fit for purpose and, and is genuinely best in breed. Safety and security, I think we've probably adequately covered. Again, so many examples. Um, Maryland Health was one where uh, data, significant uh, ransomware caused significant disruption to their system, including not being able to provide radiotherapy for several days. So it is not a minor issue. It is absolutely critical. And again, it's a, it's a point where I say it's always best to get advice and specific advice from cybersecurity experts particularly, um, but also experts in privacy uh, law as well. And then last but by no means least is keep it simple. And this talks to the user experience and the user interface. The Cardia example that I showed there uh, earlier, which was the, the predictive algorithms in cardiac, you know, a year of work, complex um, algorithms that sit be behind it to be able to accurately identify patients at risk, um, massive time um, and expense undertaken to pull that data together in the back end and, and make it clinically meaningful and, and make it work. Front end, patient name, risk score, and what drove that risk score, and that's it. Super simple user interface because that's what that's what the clinicians asked us for, that's what they wanted to see and what was useful to, to them. So yes, it, can, it needs to be elegant and, and well designed and all the rest of it, but I think keeping it simple is, is a critical one. So that if you hold those design principles true, and I was pleased to say there were lots of overlaps there, I'm gonna steal one of yours, which is around inclusion. So I was at a demo just before I came here um, for that end-to-end -end patient solution. And we were showing the, we were showing the clinicians um, what could be done with different colors, color, colored alerts. And just as I was sitting there, I was thinking, my friend's a GP and he's colorblind. So actually, it's not just about inclusion for the user, but it's, you know, inclusion for the clinician. A red alert is going to be absolutely no use to him whatsoever. Um, get very confused. So, so that, inc that inclusion principle, I think, is really important in its, in its broadest sense. So I'm going to figure out how to make a diagram that fits six of those on. So there you have it. I've talked a little bit about the context, just some of the solutions that, that we're developing, and there are many, many others that um, a number of you will be developing and, and are out there in the market. It's that exponential change is truly happening. But if you keep these design principles um, at your core, then you can't go too far wrong.
Thank you.